I'll share this with you before we get started. You know, this week was my my wife and I anniversary, 48 years. All right, bro. Wow. And uh, oh. praise the Lord. And about the middle of the day, neither one of us said anything. And I asked her, I said, do you know what the day is? She says, yes, I know what the day is. I said, what is it? Oh, you did not. <laughs> she said, I was waiting for you to say something. Well, about the same time we both said that, we both blurted out, well, I was waiting on you to say <laughs> happy anniversary. We said it together in unison. I mean, it couldn't have been no perfect timing than that was. <laughs> And uh, neither one of us forgot it. We just was waiting to see who was going to say it first. <laughs> we do that from time to time on things. We, we kind of hold back and see who's going to remember what. <laughs> 48 years is a long time. Amen. And still remember. And still remember. Praise <laughs> the Lord. I may not be able to get around like I used to, but I'm hanging in there and taking one step at a time. Amen. Amen. It's all I can do. <laughs> even even working in the garden, you can, it's not so much you can do. Your bones don't want to cooperate, or you may want to take a step, and you might go in the wrong direction. And that's been happening to me. <laughs> uh, I tell it to go the right way, but it doesn't want to obey. <laughs> Oh, wait. That's enough of that. Hey, God is still good. Are we ready? Yes, sir. You are on. Father, we just come to you this morning in the name of Jesus. Lord, we thank you for what you're doing in our hearts, in our lives. We thank you for wisdom and knowledge and understanding of your word. But, Lord, we need more. Man. We need to be able to to take your word to heart and to put it into practice in a way that we have never done before. We need to be able to be sensitive to your spirit and your presence that yes. when you are in our midst that we hear what you're saying to us. Yes. And that we can we can respond to you, Lord, not looking to man or to some individual or some groups of people, but to you, Lord. Yes. We want to hear from you and what you're saying to our hearts. Yes. We want to be able to live each day to glorify you and everything that we say and do and the, and the works that we do with our hands and, and other things, Lord, that is for your glory and your honor, not to that we glory in it, but you gave it to us to enjoy the beauty of the flowers and the trees, the birds that sang and, and the thunder and the lightning, all those wonderful things and the rain that you've given to us in abundance this year. We're seeing things grow like never before. Amen. But we thank you for it. And I just ask today, Lord, that you have your way in our midst and that the Holy Spirit will speak to our hearts and enlighten us yes. as we go through this service on judgment phase two. It's probably going to be some pretty rough territory that we're going to be going through. But it's not to destroy, but it's to, for us to take to heart and realize judgment is coming Amen. and we are also in judgment today so when you get beat up today i want you to <laughs> jump up and shout at the end because it's worth every moment in romans chapter 5 verse 12 through 15 the bible says as paul was writing he says wherefore as by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin and so death passed upon all men for that all have sinned for until the law sin was in the world but sin is not imputed where there is no law mm -hmm. nevertheless death reigned from adam to moses even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of adam's transgression who is the figure of him that was to come but not as the offense so also is the free gift for if though if through the offense of one many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abound unto many. 
We live in a day when the very fear of God's judgment, the God of most Americans, is a feeble, tolerant old man who would never send anyone except the very worst to hell. This American God grades on the curve and, and it's very lenient curve. Unless you are a terrorist or a mass murderer, a serial rapist or a habitual child molester, you have nothing to fear come judgment day. That's the popular theology of all day. If you are a good person, it doesn't matter what you may believe about God or Jesus Christ, but don't worry about your sin. God understands and will overlook them. Someday we'll, we'll all be together in heaven in spite of our many faults. It is vitally important that we base our view of God and his future judgments on his revelation and his word, not on the common notion of popular culture. If we join our culture in thinking that God's judgment is nothing to fear, when in fact we are in danger of coming under that judgment, we would be in for a horrible shock of that day. On the other hand, in, if in fact that we will be uh, delivered from the judgment according to God's promise in Christ Jesus, we would be putting ourselves through needless misery to live in fear of that day. All of mankind without distinction are under the curse of sin and judged as sinful and separated from God. Apart from the saving grace of God in Christ, all fall short of the glory of God. Amen. The immoral, the moral, and religious, the only exception is the person of Jesus Christ who, through the virgin birth, escaped the sin problem that is normally passed down from generation to generation. As we look at these scriptures today, I want you to take to heart, I want you to think about them. Because God is trying to tell us some things that we need to really look at and examine for our own personal selves. None of us are exempt. We're all born in sin. We all are going to die in sin. That's right. And so we need to guard our hearts, our minds, against the things that pull us away from God. Now, Paul said this in Romans 1.18, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who hold the truth in unrighteousness. And then in Romans 3, 9, he tells us, he says, what then? Are we better than they? No, in no wise, for we have before proved, both Jew and Gentiles, that they are all under sin. And then we read that very famous verse that you hear so many people quoting, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There is no exemption. No one gets away with it. Yeah, how hard he may try, he will not escape the judgments that's coming. According to Romans chapter 1, 18 through 32, I'm not reading any of that, but you can read it for yourself. When men turn away from the knowledge of God and reveal so vividly in creation God, as an expression of his holy wrath turns men over to their own devices and foolish imagination. This always results in the moral devastation uh, and degeneration. Paul teaches us that the very forms of awful sinfulness of man have their beginnings in the rejection of the revelation of God in creation. Ungodliness is always a source of unrighteousness. Ungodliness, turning away from God, leads to idolatry, man worshiping the products of his own mind and hands. Mm -hmm. 
But you think about that for a moment. Man worshiping the products of his own mind and hands. And idolatry leads to unchained sensuality. It's so easy today in the world that we live in to be caught up in this. With the technology that we have, I, I, I look at people when I'm in town going down the street and what are they, what are they doing? They're walking around with their cell phones or iPods or iPads or whatever you want to call them. And their heads are buried in those things and they're not seeing what's going on around them. Right. They get caught up in them. And then I hear that people spend seven and eight hours a day on those things. And my question is, what are they looking at? What are they reading? I have an iPhone, uh, not an iPhone, but I have a cell phone, <laughs> an Android. But mainly I use it to text. If I text, I don't text a lot, but or I call, I'll use it. That's basically it. Sometimes I'll look at what uh, my sister might put on the Facebook page. But I'm there for a moment or two and gone. And then the email, I don't look at any email on it because I go to the computer if there's any email. And, and then I erase everything on that page. I don't leave nothing unless it's very, very important. Because if you leave one thing, a thousand more things will come in its place. And the next thing you know, you find yourself down there trying to decipher what in the world are they trying to tell me or what are they trying to sell me? Right. I ain't interested in that. I'm only interested in what God wants me to know. And so I try to keep that stuff off of there. You can't turn the thing on without some advertising coming up, trying to sell you this and sell you that. I don't need none of that. I know what I want if I want it. And I know where to go get it if I need it. I don't need them to tell me that. Well, that's the thing that is causing a lot of problems today. Because it is the products of their own minds and their hands that they are using. And they're trying their level best to be God. And as they refuse to follow the light, they were brought to fall into their thoughts because vain in their corrupt reasoning and their foolish, senseless heart was darkened. The intellectual revolt against what they knew to be right was attended by a darkening of the whole understanding. The, the refusal to accept the truth destroyed the power of discriminate between truth and error. Verse 24 of Romans 1 it says God gave them over to the lust of their hearts this is a deeper than mere lust of the flesh I want you to distinguish between the two here for a moment God gave them over to the lust of their hearts flesh has a natural desire or a natural lust a heart is the innermost part of our being there's a separation there. And which may or may not be yielded to, the lust of the heart continues after the flesh is dissolved and even when in torment bodies of the damned. Now, what you think about this? You ever wondered how and what God is going to punish somebody for for all eternity? What you love to do in the heart is what you're going to be tormented with for all eternity if you're not saved. Hmm. Damnation. The mind, the flesh, does surrender. But once it's gone, it's dead, it's no more operative. But the spirit, the heart, is still in operation. Jesus said, fear not the, the one who can kill the body but fear him who can kill both the body and the spirit.
God Almighty. So the flesh is the things that we think about. Now, you know, we, 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 I've said it many times, and I'm sure Pastor Joshua has said it too from time to time, that it's what we think in our minds. Because what happens when you think it in your mind, it goes where? To the heart. Jesus said what comes out of the heart is what destroys man, not what he eats. It's the innermost part of our being. If it gets down into our heart, then we will do what the heart says to do. So that's why Paul says to guard your thoughts. Guard your mind. Because if you don't guard it, old Slewfoot's going to have a heyday with you. He's going to do everything in his power to stop you from doing what God wants you to do. Amen. Now remember this, if you don't remember anything I say today, the lust of the heart will forever exist. You cannot just shove it off and forget about it. Now that's coming out of Romans chapter 1 verse 24. Now look at what Paul says in 125. He says, for they changed the truth of God into a lie. That God is glorious, incorruptible, infinite, is the truth, and that any image whatsoever, be it gold, silver, wood, stone, picture of, or symbol, is God. God here names this the lie. Any such uh, thing connected with worship is a fearful travesty of their divine majesty. Think of it. They worship and serve the created thing rather than the creator. Things man has made. Things that man produces. They create, they love those things more than they love God. But this happened as a judgment from God against man's arrogant independence. The condition is the expression of God's wrath, verse 18, and twice we have the statement of this, that this uh, moral breakdown occurs because God gave them over to a reprobate mind. Paul tells us in Ephesians 4, 17 and 18, this I say, therefore testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk and in the vanity of their minds. Having the understanding dark and being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their hearts. Their heart, it didn't say the mind. It said the blindness of their hearts. The judgment of Christ for the sin of the world takes two aspects. Christ's judgment for sin, dying in the place of the sinner, bearing his sin, and judgment on the cross as the sinner's substitute. He went there and he paid an ultimate price for mine and, and your sins and for all the sins of the people of the world. I like that song we sang. We need to do it more often. He paid a debt he did not owe. I owe a debt I could not pay. That's why I sing amazing grace. How sweet the sound. You see, that's what it's all about. He paid it all at Calvary. Isaiah chapter 53, 4 through 6 says, Surely our grief he hath uh, himself born and our sorrows he carried yet we ourselves esteem him stricken smitten of God and afflicted but he was pierced through for our transgression he was crushed for our iniquities the ch chastening for our well-being fell upon him and by his scourging we are healed all of us like sheep have gone astray each of us have turned to his own way but the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on Jesus Christ. Paul said it in 2 Corinthians 5.21. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf. That we might become the righteousness of God in him. 
And then in 1 Peter 2.24, he says, For he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness, for by his wounds you were healed, or by his stripes you are healed. You see, there's spiritual healing and there's physical healing. God didn't leave it all out. He provided Many times we need that physical healing as well as the spiritual. But sometimes our spiritual it, uh, in a man gets so corrupt because we allow things to infiltrate our soulish man that penetrates into the heart. And if we don't keep that slate clean, we don't examine it, it's going to cost us. We're going to pay a price for it. We'll see that as I go through this this morning. In 3.24 of Romans 24 through 26, it says, Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. To declare, I say, at this time his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus Christ. Sin requires penalty. The penalty of death as God's holy judgment on sin. Jesus Christ, the sinless and perfect Son of God, the only one who could qualify as a substitute, died to satisfy the demands of God's absolute holiness. Sin calls for judgment, and the cross of Jesus Christ became the place of judgment. Think about this now. When Jesus was hanging there on that cross, he looked out down through the ages right to where we are today. He knew that man was going to mess up. He knew that man couldn't hold it together. But he cried out before he, he gave up the ghost. He says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He knew that. That's why when he went to Calvary and shed his blood, it was to wash away all the sins of mankind that would come to him and confess that they are a sinner, that they are lost. But you see, a lot of people will not do that. They will not come to Jesus. They will not confess their sins. They will continue on. Oh, he's not going to do anything to me. He's not going to take away anything that I have. Everything I have, I worked for. I've done it on my own. I don't need him anymore. But one day they're going to wake up and God says, I don't know who you are. You have turned your back on me and walked away. Now, judgment has come. In 1 John 2, 2, the Bible says he is the propitiation for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for the sins. I want you to note that right there in that last part of that verse. He did not say part of the world. He did not say a possibility. But he said for the whole world. All of it. Christ's judgment unto sins reign the judgment of the believer's sin nature not only did christ die for our sins as the lamb of god but he died to break the reign of sin in the lives of those who put their trust in him as their savior this means that through co-identification with christ in his death on the cross the believer's sin nature was also judged crucified with Christ in his death so that its power has been broken and neutralized. Through the death of Christ, so through the death of Christ does not obliviate the presence of the sin nature, and though it's still, it is still a powerful enemy that you and I have to face every day. The believer's union with Christ in his death provides for divine forgiveness, for the fact that sin, nature, and for the victory over its reigning power. Paul tells us in Romans chapter 6, verse 7 and 10, 
I like what Paul said, and it gives me encouragement when I'm struggling alone. He says, for he that is dead is freed from sin. Do I hear an amen? amen. Knowing, now, if I have been uh, be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, being raised from the dead, dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him. Hallelujah! There is no more power Amen. of death over you as a believer in Jesus Christ. For oh, in that he died, listen to what he's saying. He died unto sin, what? Once. That doesn't mean he comes back and die again. He paid it all at Calvary. Amen. But in, in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. He gave you the ability to live, not to die. He gave you back what the devil took from Adam and Eve in the garden. Amen. Galatians 2.20, Paul says this. He says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. People need to let that sink in a little bit because he did. He loved me a lot more than I ever loved him. Amen. He took away the sins that I couldn't get rid of. Amen. He washed them whiter than snow. He Praise gave me, gave me a, he took out that old stony heart that was so hard of hearing and hard of understanding and he put a heart of flesh in and he began to work on me. He began to change me from what I once was to what I'm going to be. You know he's not finished yet. <laughs> Praise the Lord. We're going to take a little bit look at the present judgment. The self-judgment of the believer. Now here, don't you get mad at me what I'm going to say to you. <laughs> but it's something that we need to look at. We need to think about because each one of us are going to have to give an account to Jesus Christ. So we need to look at what he's saying. Then the self judgment of the believer an interesting and important passage to this study of this word is in Acts 24, 15 and 16 because of this passage, Paul implicitly made references to two judgments, which are closely related. Let's look at it for a moment. In uh, chapter 24 of Acts 15 and 16, and have hope toward God, which they themselves also allow that there shall be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and unjust. And you notice that there, the resurrection of the just and the unjust. No one is exempt from this judgment. No one. But let's look at something else there, he says. And herein do I exercise myself to have always a conscience void of offense toward God and toward man. So you hear something a lot of people don't go around doing. We need to keep our conscience clean, Amen. clear, and holy in the eyes of God. The resurrection of the just mentioned in verse 15 will be followed by the judgment seat of Christ or the bema. The place and time when believers will be examined for rewards of their loss, knowing and having the hope of the resurrection and all that this means to the Christian. The apostle spoke of his commitment to maintain a clear conscience. One cleared by confession and the forsaken of all known sin. This is something that's very, very important. We don't keep our conscience clean. Just remember this. You let it build up. The devil's going to shoot something else in there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then it's going to penetrate right into your heart. Right. And it's going to cause a lot of problems. That's why a daily confession, Lord, <laughs> what's in there that I don't know about? Mm -hmm. If it's something there that you, that you want to get right, get clean, let me know. Help me, because I am weak, but you are strong. Amen. 
and I know that you can help me get that thing out of me, whatever it may be. I may falter, I may fail, I may stumble along life's journey, but let me tell you something. The Bible says I can get up again, and I can come to Jesus, and I can say, Lord, have mercy on a sinner such as I. I'm not even worthy of asking you, Lord, for anything, but I know your mercy. I know your grace. I know your love. I know your understanding. I just need to understand it a little bit more. <laughs> you know, knowing and having the hope of the resurrection and all that this means to the Christian and the apostle spoke of his commitment to maintain a clear conscience, one cleared by confession and forsaken all known sin. He wanted to, wanted, uh, to walk blamelessly, to keep short, accounts with God and to stay in close communion with the Lord lest he should become disqualified for reward of the Bema. First John 1 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Proverbs 28 13 tells us there, he says, He that covereth his sins shall not prosper. But whoso confesses and forsakes them shall have mercy. Though believers are saved and justified by faith in Christ as the crucified Savior, the scripture assumes that Christians will battle with sin and will not always be victorious. you got a battle on your hands. The greatest battle that you have is right here behind your eyes. You're going to fight with that daily. So it's necessary for believers to judge their own sins in the light of the scripture. This is a serious matter with the consequences both for time and eternity, since the failure to do so leads not only to the loss of rewards, but the judgment of God, disciples of his believing children as a loving father and the vine dresser who must prune the vine of production. You know what? God's going to prune you. He's going to chop on you. He's going to cut away all that stuff if you let him. See, that's one thing we need to ask the Lord. Cut it off. Get rid of it. And it's very interesting, enlightened, and important passage to this subject is 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 27 through 32. For in this passage, we have a reference to both the self judgment of the believer and the discipline of judgment of God on the believer. Look at it with me there. Paul says this. What did I give you? 1 Corinthians 11. 11, 27 through 32. I hit the wrong one. That's okay. <laughs> We're not perfect. For sure. Yeah. First Corinthians chapter 11, verse 27 through 32. Paul said this, Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. Uh, Pastor said this this morning about it when we were taking communion. Yeah. But let a man examine himself. And so let him eat the, that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, look at what he's saying, we should not be judged. We better start taking a look at ourselves. Amen? Amen. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord that we should not be condemned with the world. Some of the Christians at Corinth were being externally religious. They were assembling themselves with other believers and partaking of the Lord's Supper. But they were out of fellowship with the Lord and were controlled by the sinful nature, the flesh, rather than by the Holy Spirit. 
This is why earlier the apostle called them fleshly. How many times have you ever heard some of these other people out here that's supposed to be Christians say, well, I'm carnal. Get out of the flesh and get into the spirit and you won't be. I know we carry old man around. I know that the old man flares up from time to time. But you know what? If the Holy Ghost is in, in control, you're going to keep the old man down. He's not going to jump in there. You see, unfortunately, this condition had continued through some of these believers and had failed to examine their hearts and judge their sin by honest confession, followed by a commitment to deal with it in the power of the Spirit. As a result, a number of things occurred. They were making mockery of the significance and meaning of the Lord's Supper. They were experiencing personal discipline by the Lord, which exists in three conditions, evidently progressively. And though not mentioned here, they were, listen to what I'm going to tell you, they were producing wood, hay, and stubble. That's what they were doing. They were losing rewards. Look at what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 3, 14 and 15. If any man work a bad with which he hath built thereon, he shall receive rewards. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. But he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. And to the immediate consequences, some were weak, some were feeble, some lost of energy. Some were sick, probably chronic disease, and some were asleep, physical death. Sin unto death. But these were not the only consequences of failing to judge sin in their lives. They were also divisions and fractions and the focus on personalities rather than on the Savior. They were showing favoritism and hurting other believers rather than showing love and concern as it should be among believers in Christ. In other words, when we fail to honestly judge sin in our lives, it spills over in one area after another. As the loving Father that He is, God must break out the board of discipline in His loving commitment to bring us back to himself i say this to you this morning some years ago we had and i've used this illustration we had a guy to come in this church and and i'm not saying this to because he's passed on now because he can't defend himself but he came in this church and he stank so bad i couldn't stand to be around him my first instinct was to get him out of here because he stanked up the whole church. Because see, he was living down here on the Appomattox River. I talked to him about the Lord, but he never made any commitments or anything. I don't know if somebody else had might have. I just planted a seed, but God brings in the harvest. But, you know, I had to repent of that thing. <laughs> and then I'm going to tell you another story of a pastor up in Ohio. He had a similar circumstance that happened to me. And this is when God really told me, you need to repent of what you were thinking. And this pastor was up there preaching that salvation message that day. And, that, and this young guy had come in and he sat down on the second balcony at the very top. He sat down on, on there and he was listening to that pastor. I mean, he was so smelly, nobody could stand to be around him. And the pastor gave the altar call. And that young man got up out of his seat and he went down front. And the pastor smelt him. And the pastor said, and he said, I said to myself, I can't go down there. God says, you get down there. You pray for that young man. That pastor mustered up another strength and he walked down off of that platform and he went down to where that young man was seated. And he began to pray 
with him and that young man received Jesus Christ, hallelujah, into his Amen. heart. And within a year or so, that young man became the youth minister of that church. God changed him because the pastor obeyed. God dealt with me the way I thought about that man that came in here. I had to repent of that thing. I had no right judging him because he was in a situation that he, he had no control over at the time. He probably found a way, but he probably didn't want to do anything about it. I don't know. I don't know his, his life history, but I do know one thing. You don't look at somebody and judge them because you don't like the way they dress, the way they talk, or the way they act. As long as somebody is clean on the inside, and he comes in with an open heart and a desire to know Jesus Christ. Open your arms up and welcome him in. That's right. Don't turn him away. That's right. I've had people in, in the prison. I had a guy that was a homosexual. He came up to me one Sunday morning. And he said, he said, I'm, I'm a homosexual. I said, I know that. He said, but can I come into your service? I said, you come as long as you want to. And he said, but I've been trying to kick the habit. I, I went home <laughs> and, uh, and I gave him a lot, wrote down a lot of scriptures and I carried them back to him the next Sunday he came. I said, now, if you really want deliverance, God can deliver you. And, and I gave him those scriptures. I mean, I gave him, I think, about three or four pages. And all he had to do was read them. And if he really meant business, God would have changed him. I don't know to this day whether he changed or not, but it's up to God. I did what God said to do. But you see, you don't turn them away. Because you turn them away, you're not being the child that God called you to be. Right. Well, I don't like the way he looks. So what? I don't like the way you look. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm not the judge. God is. And so the thing of it is, and what I'm trying to say is, don't close your heart. When God opens a door, you step in and do what the Lord says to do. Don't be judgmental because you being judgmental, you're causing a problem in that life. And it can destroy you and it can destroy everyone around you. Keep your conscience clean. Keep your heart pure because Jesus is the one going to clean up your act if you let him mm -hmm. say lord come in here and do a work on me whatever it takes to get me where i need to be i'm willing I, i'm ready to submit to you i'm ready to lay it all down on the line and you know what if you really mean business god will do it Amen. i've seen it done time and time again Amen. hallelujah So Christians need to examine their hearts and actions for sin according to Scripture and then judge the sin that they have they find as sin and confess it to the Lord. Our tendency is to rationalize, excuse our sin, but God says if we are to judge them as sin to God, confession and sin restores us to fellowship and to the Spirit's control. When the Spirit uh, back and when the spirit's back in control and the believers in fellowship, the state of abiding in the vine, he and she or anyone else that produces fruit for, for which they receive the reward at the beam seat of Jesus. As seen in as some of these scriptures that we have looked at, the self judgment. The New Testament clearly teaches us that one of the ministries of our Heavenly Father is the ministry of loving discipline. God discipline is patterned after the principle of Proverbs chapter 13, verse 24, in which reads, And he who spares his rod hates his son, but he who loves him disciplines him diligently. Now I read from another Bible, but I want to give it to you from the Hebrews as you must most of you know it anyway but he that spareth his rod hateth his son but he that loveth him chasteneth him bedtimes 
I'm a firm believer in applying the rod to the seat of knowledge. You will get understanding. Amen. Amen. Sometimes God has to apply the, the rod to our seat of knowledge <laughs> to get our understanding. In Hebrews 12, 4 through 11, it says, You have not yet resisted to the point of shedding blood in your striving against sin, and you have forgotten the exhortation which is addressed to you as son. My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor faint when you are reproved by him. For those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines, and he scourges every son whom he receives. It is for the discipline that you endure. God deals with you as with sons, for what son is there whom his father does not discipline, but he, but if you are without discipline, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Furthermore, we had earthly fathers to discipline us and respect them. Shall we not, shall we not much rather be subject to the father's spirits and live? For they discipline us for a short time as seen best to them. But he disciplines us for our good that we may share his holiness. All discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful, but sorrowful. Yet for those who have been trained by it afterwards, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. From these passages in Hebrews and others, like in 1 Corinthians 11, God disciplined his children for the following reasons. First of all, to bring a wayward child who refuses to judge himself back into fellowship. God is going to deal with us. And the next thing, and look in 1 Corinthians 11, 30 and 31, he says, For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. Then Psalm 32, 3 and 5 says, When I kept silent, my bones wax old through my roaring all the day long. For day and night thy hand was heavy upon me. My moisture is turned into the drought of summer. I acknowledge my sin unto thee, and my iniquity had I not hid. I said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and thou forgavest the iniquity of my sins. It is a part of the training process by which God's children are brought into experience of God's holiness. For they, in Hebrews chapter 12, 10, it says, For they verily for a few days chasten us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit that we might be partakers of his holiness. You see, for man's pleasure, father's pleasure, he, he chastens us, but God, he does it for his holiness to make us pure, to make us clean. And also it is an expression and a proof of God's love. You know, if a parent doesn't correct his children, that means the parent doesn't love them. But if the parent applies the rod to the seed of knowledge, that means that he loves them. Not to, to hurt them and, and discourage them, but to strengthen them. To get them to realize, hey, you're going to obey. God's saying, you're going to obey. Because I will whip you. <laughs> we don't like to be whipped. And I've been whipped. I had a two-inch leather belt go across me when I was a kid. And also had a board that daddy drilled holes in it. And let me tell you, when that thing hits, you knew you'd been hit. <laughs> Not that I was a mean kid, but sometimes daddy lost his temper, got <laughs> forgiven. <laughs> but he would whop you with that thing. When there's eight of, eight of you kids, you know you get out of hand sometimes. <laughs> and you need correction. <laughs> Never forget one day, I'm going to tell this little short story. <laughs> My oldest brother, he's gone on from now. He's not with the Lord. He didn't believe in God. I tried my level best to, to lead him to the Lord, but he, he kept refusing. He blamed God for everything. But at any rate, long story short, we were out in, back in the mountains, and, and we were back up there in a kind of valley light, and the mountains all around us, and Daddy was up on a 
kind of a high hill. And he stood out there and he hollered. We heard him holler, but the wind was blowing down through that draw and, and blowing our voices back behind us instead of sending them back to him. We answered him, but he didn't hear us. And we kept on doing what we were doing. But when we got home, we were met at the door. And we got a whipping. We went around and around that house. And every step I took, and that thing hit. I don't know how many times he hit my oldest brother. but He won't be just a year older than I was, but we were moving. <laughs> Never forget that. And he applied the rod to the seat of knowledge. And it's hung in there for all these 72 years. Praise God. It either make you or break you, which you want, which you want. <laughs> Lord help me. And the last thing, uh, one, a couple more things on this list. It designed to produce obedience and to protect them from, against untimely physical death. Paul said in Romans 8:13, "For if you live after the flesh, you shall die. But if you live through the Spirit and do mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live." If you it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. God's judgment is fair and just. Can you say amen? amen? People are condemned not for what they don't know, but for what they do and with what they know. Those who know God's written word and his law will be judged by them. Those who have never seen a Bible still know right from wrong, and they will be judged because they do not keep even those standards that their own conscience dictates mm. yeah. now you take a little child three four years old and they have a toy and another little kid comes along and sees that toy and he knows that toy doesn't belong to him and he takes it anyway and you ask him why did you do that it's mine what is he doing? He's lying. You don't have to teach them to lie. They know, automatically know how to do it. Why? Because of sin. There's no getting around it. We're born in sin. We're going to die in sin. And sin will cause you to do those things. As a little kid, I've seen it so many times. Now, you know, son, you're not supposed to do it. Yeah, but I want you to do it. Well, it's not yours, so you can't keep it. You got to give it back. Oh, me. You know, you can get into a lot of stuff when you're preaching the word, <laughs> and you'll never get done. Let's look in Matthew chapter 16, 27. Jesus said this For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and they then he shall reward every man according to his works. Christians will be judged by how they use God's gifts. Christ has been given the authority to judge all the earth. In Romans 14, 9 through 11, look at what Paul says. He says, for to this cause of uh, this end, Christ both died and rose and revived that he might be Lord both of the dead and living. But why doest thou judge thy brother or why doest thou sit at naught thy brother for we shall all stand before the judgment seat of christ for it is written as i live saith the lord every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to me philippians 2 9 and 11 he says wherefore god also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name that at the name of jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Notice that. He said every tongue will confess. Every being in hell will confess Jesus, even though they can't be saved, but they will confess. Although his judgment is already working in our life, there is a future. Final judgment when Christ returns and every one's life is reviewed and evaluated. This will not be confined to unbelievers. Christians, too, will face judgment. Their eternal destiny 
is secured. But Jesus will look at how they handle the gifts and opportunities and responsibilities in order to determine the heavenly rewards. At the time of judgment, God will deliver the righteous and condemn the wicked. We should not judge others' salvation. That is not our job. That is not our place. Sometimes you'd like to <laughs> because you look at what they do and what they, how they live and act and everything. Charles Wendell said this, remind the uh, religious phony that the splinter within your eye is between you and your Lord and to pay attention to the tree trunk in his own eye. Tree trunk is mighty big, isn't it? You're not going to look around that joker. You got to get it out. There is a present judgment which is taking place daily in the life of the believer. This continual judgment must be going on in the life of the believer, or there will be judgment from God because of the consequence failure to grow in grace. There must be a constant and continual judging of sin as it comes in the believer's life. And I close with this that we read from 1 John this morning, 5 and 7. It says, "Then This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Amen. Now, I know you you say, well, I hope he's over with the judgment. <laughs> Not really. There may be there may be two or three more. <laughs> but we're going, we're, we're going to go through them. Because we just dealt with the present that we're in now. Then there's the day that's coming. We're going to be dealing with. And then we're going to be dealing with the end time judgment. Yeah. And there's a lot in the scriptures on all of this. Uh, there was so many different routes I could take with this today, but I felt this was the one that we needed to uh, take a look at and get it before us so that we can move ahead with God. But as the Lord gives it to me, and I'm asking him because I tell you, I don't know what I'm going to do, but I do know where he's headed. Father, I just thank you for your word today. I thank you for just examine our hearts, Lord. We all need to come clean. We all need to look at ourselves and, and look at what, what's being done and what's being said and how it's being said and, and to whom we're saying it. Because sometimes we say things we have no business saying. And those things, Lord, are hurtful to you as well as to us. As we, when we do those things, we grieve your Holy Spirit. And you told us in your word, as Paul had given it to us, grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, for he's very sensitive. And Lord, help us to be sensitive to your spirit and, and recognize our thought patterns, our heart patterns, because so many times we, we tend to forget. And we blurt out things and we say things we have no business saying. But we know your mercy. We know your grace. We know you, that you understand us far better than we understand ourselves. So we just ask that you forgive us this day. Cleanse our hearts. Cleanse our minds through the blood of Jesus Christ. Wash us and make us whiter than snow. And help us, Lord, if we falter, if we fail, if we stumble, to get back up and get back in the right relationship that you would have us to be in. Amen. We praise you and we thank you for your word and your presence and the work you're doing in our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 We sung that song, Amazing Grace, but we're going to do it one more time. Because <laughs> right. it's his amazing grace amen. that saved a wretch like me. Amen. Amen. You did.
Amazing grace. 